We all love to imagine that every great invention is accompanied by that perfect Archimedes moment. A brilliant inventor dashing through the streets, proudly showcasing their discovery while exclaiming Eureka for the world to see. However, the dramatic scene we envision rarely unfolds that way. More often, an invention is developed with one purpose in mind, but ultimately finds an entirely different use when it reaches the public. In some instances, scientists remain unaware of the true nature of their discovery because their focus lies elsewhere. Today, we're going to dive into the top 10 scientific achievements that emerged entirely by accident. Viagra In the late 1980s, the renowned pharmaceutical company Pfizer set out to develop a medication designed to treat both high blood pressure and angina, which is chest pain caused by reduced blood flow to the heart. Their experimental drug, sildenafil, was engineered to block PDE5, a protein that regulates blood flow without disrupting its natural function. By 1989, sildenafil had shown enough promise to be advanced to clinical trials. Unfortunately, during these trials, the drug failed to meet initial expectations, leading many to consider abandoning the project. However, a pivotal clinical trial in the early 1990s changed everything by revealing an entirely new and unexpected use for the drug. To conduct the trial, Pfizer recruited a group of local miners from the town of Myrtle Tiffel in Wales, offering each participant £300 to take the drug and spend the night in a clinic for studies and blood tests. The following morning, the participants were asked if they experienced any unexpected side effects. While nearly everyone said no, one Welsh miner raised his hand and revealed that he'd experienced erections throughout the night. It remains unclear whether others were too embarrassed to admit the same or if this particular subject had received a higher dose. However, the former seems more likely given the circumstances. Further investigation revealed that while the drug wasn't performing as expected in relaxing blood vessels around the heart and improving blood flow, it was effectively doing so in the penis. Essentially, Pfizer had unintentionally developed the first true medication for erectile dysfunction, and they quickly recognized the implications. In 1996, they patented the drug, and just two years later, it received FDA approval and was marketed as Viagra. Just before we continue today, I just want to say, should be honest about things, the older I get, Definitely getting older. Was 38 years old yesterday. The more a night of drinks feels like I'm negotiating with my future self. Good night or good morning, not both. Until now. Because Zbiotics, the sponsor of today's video, have created Pre Alcohol Probiotic, which is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists with giant brains to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works when you drink, your body creates a toxic byproduct in your gut. That's what's actually responsible for how you feel the next day. It's not dehydration, it's that unpleasantness going on in the gut. And this probiotic deals with that. I've tried it, I've uh, experimented with this thoroughly, and uh, pretty incredible stuff, because uh, like, I do get older. I never used to get hangovers, now I do. And now I don't. Zbiotics, thank you. You make it your first drink of the night, then you, of course, drink responsibly, and you will feel your best the next morning. Click the link in the description below. You'll get 15% off your first order with free shipping. And if you're not happy, they'll refund you. No questions asked. And let's get back to today's video. LSD. In 1938, Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman was assigned by his employer Sandoz to develop ergot, a fungus thought to possess potential medicinal properties. The main goal was to develop compounds that could stimulate the respiratory system and enhance breathing. Hoffman began his work by combining lysergic acid, one of ergot's active components, with various other substances. One of his initial experiments produced LSD-25, a compound created by blending lysergic acid with diethylamine, an ammonia derivative. While the compound led animal subjects to display heightened and somewhat erratic behavior, it did not demonstrate any significant medical benefits, and research on LSD-25 was eventually discontinued. Until 1943, Hoffman had set aside his work on the compound, but that year, he found himself thinking about it again, recalling the unusual effects it had produced in animals. Years after the compound had been initially tested, he decided to revisit LSD-25 and resume his experiments. During his formulation process, Hoffman accidentally spilled a small amount of LSD on his skin. Within a short time, he began feeling dizzy and restless. Intrigued by these effects and curious about what they might signify, he concluded that further trials were necessary, and he chose himself as the test subject. On April the 19th, 1943, a day now celebrated by acid enthusiasts as Bicycle Day, Hoffman self-administered 250 micrograms of LSD before setting out on a bike ride. During that ride, he experienced the world's first documented acid trip, observing a distorted reality that he later described as resembling the view through a curved mirror. In the ensuing years, both governments and private researchers, as well as many individuals seeking a memorable experience, would conduct experiments with LSD. Teflon 
At the turn of the 20th century, refrigeration technology began revolutionizing food storage worldwide. With its capacity to maintain cooler temperatures, it transformed our diets, reshaped global trade, and redefined entire economies. Yet the early days of refrigeration were fraught with challenges. The first refrigerators relied on toxic gases such as sulfur dioxide, SO2, methyl chloride, CH3Ci, and ammonia, NH3, creating significant poisoning risks, not only in factories where these machines were made, but also in the homes where they were installed. Unfortunately, these dangers were merely the beginning, as numerous fatalities and environmental disasters were later linked to these pioneering refrigeration systems. To address these issues, DuPont assigned Dr. Roy J. Plunkett to experiment with alternative gases that could replace the toxic ones. During these tests, an accidental breakthrough occurred on April 6, 1938. After producing 100 pounds of tetrafluoroethylene ethylene, or TFE, Plunkett and his team froze the substance in small canisters at dry ice temperatures before treating it with chlorine. However, when they opened the canisters, they discovered something unexpected. Instead of the anticipated gas, the substance had polymerized into a white, waxy, solid powder. Plunkett immediately began testing this new material, which was soon named polytetrafluoroethylene, or PTFE. It was quickly found to be both extremely slippery and chemically inert to almost all substances it encountered. In 1945, the material was trademarked as Teflon, and it would later be used in cookware, clothing, cosmetics, and a variety of other products. Meanwhile, the word Teflon itself became synonymous with something so slippery that it's virtually uncatchable. Superglue during times of major war, resource concerns typically dominate discussions from government leaders to the general public. However, during World War II, these concerns reached unprecedented levels, sparking laboratories and scientists to search for alternatives to traditional resources. One initiative emerged from the Eastman Kodak Company, which in 1942 assigned Dr. Harry Wesley Coover to the task of developing clear plastic gun sights to conserve metal. In his search for a suitable material, Dr. Coover inadvertently created cyanoacrylate, a new substance. Despite its remarkable durability, the material had one unfortunate drawback. It adhered to everything it touched, making it unsuitable for gun sites. Although Coover and his team initially abandoned this new substance, a project more than a decade later brought him back to it. While working on heat-resistant polymers for jet canopies, he was reminded of the sticky material from earlier experiments and decided to revisit it. Recognizing its potential, Coover and his employer patented the substance in 1956 under the name Alcohol Catalyzed Cyanoacrylate Adhesive Composition slash Superglue. Realizing that their name was a little bit unwieldy, indeed, they soon rebranded it as Eastman 910 and later simply Superglue. While Superglue might be best known for its role in crafting and hobbies, its importance extends far beyond those uses. During the Vietnam War, this adhesive played a crucial role in sealing open wounds, effectively stopping bleeding and saving countless lives. In modern medicine, derivatives of Coover's original discovery, various cyanoacrylate adhesives, are used daily in sutureless surgeries, such as sealing bleeding ulcers and reconnecting veins and arteries, among other applications. X-rays In the late 19th century, the scientific community saw a surge of interest in radiation and its properties. Although Henri Becquerel is credited with discovering natural radioactivity in 1896 and Marie and Pierre Curie later coined the term, another scientist uncovered radiation a year earlier. In 1895, Wilhelm Röntgen, a physics professor in Würzburg, Bavaria, made a groundbreaking discovery while experimenting with cathode ray tubes. These tubes are vacuum devices that use heat to fire electrons from a negatively charged surface toward a phosphorescent screen generating visible images. This technology laid the foundation for image production in televisions, video games, computer monitors, and nearly every other screen-based device for decades. Cathode ray tubes reigned supreme until the early 2010s, when flat panel display technology such as LEDs and LCDs began to be mass-produced widely. While testing whether cathode rays could pass through glass, Ronkin applied a high voltage to a tube and observed that it began emitting a soft green glow. Curious about the phenomenon, he covered the tube with heavy black paper, yet to his surprise, the glow still projected onto a nearby fluorescent screen. Through additional experimentation, Ronkin discovered that this mysterious light could pass through most materials, casting distinct shadows of solid objects. Most astonishingly, he found that it could even penetrate human tissue, revealing the bones beneath on the screen positioned behind the subject. Although he did not yet comprehend the nature or mechanics of this phenomenon, Ronkin named the enigmatic light X-rays. Despite the mystery that still surrounded them, news of X-rays and their clear potential in medicine spread rapidly. 
Within a year of their discovery, doctors across Europe and the United States were using this revolutionary technology to view bone fractures, locate kidney stones, identify swallowed objects, and much more. By 1901, Röntgen's groundbreaking work had earned him the very first Nobel Prize in physics. Although safer and more advanced imaging methods would eventually be developed, his accidental discovery laid the foundation for all future medical imaging technologies. Microwaves in 1945, Percy Spencer was working at Raytheon, a U.S. defense contractor where he was developing compact cavity magnetron tubes. These devices generate microwaves by using a magnetic field to interact with a stream of electrons and are commonly employed in radar technology. However, Spencer soon discovered that microwaves had another unexpected use. As a fan of payday candy bars, Spencer always kept one in his pocket. And one day, while working with the magnetrons, he noticed a surprise, and that was that the candy bar had begun to melt. Thanks to his deep understanding of the machines, he quickly realized that the microwaves emitted by the magnetron were responsible for this. Intrigued, he started experimenting with other foods, popcorn, cold meals, eggs, and even water, all of which heated up in the same way that the candy bar had. Recognizing the significance of his discovery, Spencer set out to create the world's first microwave oven. He named this early prototype the Raider Range. This massive machine stood six feet tall, that's 1.8 meters, weighed over 750 pounds or 340 kilos, and was first installed on a nuclear-powered cargo ship. With a price tag of $5,000, which is $52,000 in today's money, the Raider Range was a world apart from the sleek, affordable microwaves that we know today. Yet Spencer's accidental discovery would eventually change the way people prepare and consume food. By the 70s, food companies had begun to offer frozen, microwavable snacks and dinners, and today, over 90% of US households have a microwave. Safety Glass Edouard Benedictus was a French inventor and chemist who, at the turn of the 20th century, was experimenting with cellulose nitrate, a highly flammable compound used in various applications from gunpowder to early plastics like celluloid. In 1903, during one of his experiments, Benedictus accidentally knocked over a glass container coated with cellulose nitrate. Typically, such an accident would result in shards of glass scattering everywhere, as anyone who has dropped a coffee mug can attest. But this time, something unusual happens. Instead of shattering into pieces, Benedictus discovered that the cellulose nitrate formed a coating on the glass flask, holding it together upon impact. While this coating didn't make the flask truly unbreakable, it was the next best thing. It was shatterproof glass. In the years that followed, Benedictus continued to experiment with his discovery, exploring its practical applications. By 1909, he had devised a method of sandwiching a thin film of cellulose nitrate between two layers of glass, a design he patented under the name Triplex. A decade later, this innovation proved so influential that Henry Ford adopted it for all of his car windshields, eliminating the long-standing danger of glass shattering during collisions. Although cellulose nitrate was eventually replaced by more durable materials like polycarbonate, the technique of layering materials between two or more sheets of glass, now known as laminated glass, endured. Today, laminated glass remains widely used in vehicles, buildings, safety eyewear, and many other applications. Pacemakers in 1887, Augustus Desiree Waller recorded the first human surface electrocardiogram at St. Mary's Hospital in London. This groundbreaking achievement confirmed Waller's long-held theory that the heart possesses electromotive properties, paving the way for future advancements in electrophysiology. In the ensuing years, scientists, physicians, and inventors began experimenting with devices that could use electrical currents to restart the heart. Although some success was achieved by the 1950s, the challenge of regulating the heart to maintain a steady rhythm persisted until an accidental discovery by an engineer changed everything. In 1956, Wilson Greatbatch was constructing a device to record heartbeats when he realized he needed a resistor. Reaching into his toolbox, he accidentally selected the wrong component and unknowingly connected it to the circuit. To his surprise, the circuit emitted a pulse lasting exactly 1.8 milliseconds, followed by a one-second pause, perfectly mimicking the rhythm of the human heartbeat. Immersed in heartbeat research, Greatbatch instantly recognized the significance of his discovery. Two years later, in 1958, Wilson Greatbatch partnered with Dr. William Chardak of the Buffalo VA Hospital and Dr. Andrew Gage to implant an electrode into a dog, connecting it to a pulse generator. Over the following two years, the team developed a device that could be fully implanted in the human body without any external apparatus. Then, in 1960, they made history by successfully implanting the first pacemaker in a 77-year-old man who lived another 10 months with the device inside him. 
Although that initial pacemaker was primitive compared to later models, its groundbreaking technology transformed medicine and ultimately saved millions of lives, all because one man accidentally grabbed the wrong tool. Insulin to most in the academic community, the discovery of insulin is commonly attributed to Canadian doctors Frederick Banting and Charles Best. In 1921, while working at the University of Toronto, the duo successfully isolated the hormone from a dog's pancreas and demonstrated its vital role in regulating blood sugar levels. This relationship had been suggested earlier, in 1910, by British physiologist Sir Edward Albert Sharpie Schaefer, who even coined the term insulin. However, it was an accidental discovery made more than 30 years earlier that truly paved the way for the future research in the field. Oskar Minkowski, a Lithuanian-born researcher renowned for his surgical expertise, had spent several years studying medicine before making his mark. In the 1880s, he became the first person to successfully remove a liver from an animal, thereby demonstrating the organ's role in producing bile. While serving as an associate professor of medicine in Strasbourg, Minkowski met fellow researcher Joseph von Meering, and the two soon began debating whether animals could survive without a pancreas. Confident in his surgical skills, Minkowski decided to attempt the procedure the very next day, with von Meering assisting him. While the procedure was successfully completed, the pair soon began to notice signs of extreme thirst in the dog, accompanied by weight loss, weakness, and excessive urination. When they tested the dog's urine, they discovered unusually high sugar levels, an observation that pointed to diabetes and established a further connection for exploration. Penicillin On September 3, 1928, Scottish physician and microbiologist Alexander Fleming returned to St Mary's Hospital in London, where he served as a professor of bacteriology. Before leaving for vacation, Fleming had left Petri dishes containing Staphylococcus, the bacteria responsible for sore throats, boils, and abscesses, unattended in his laboratory. Upon his return, he noticed that mold had begun to grow in the dishes and seemed to be preventing the bacteria from spreading. Intrigued, he investigated further and discovered that the mold was secreting a substance that killed the bacteria. After experimenting with this substance, Fleming identified its powerful antibacterial properties and named the new compound penicillin. He then instructed his assistants to isolate penicillin from the mold, but their efforts only achieved modest results. They managed to produce crude solutions, leaving the team with little usable material. Although Fleming published his findings in the British Journal of Experimental Pathology in 1929, his paper made only a brief mention of the substance's potential benefits. This brevity suggests that either he did not fully grasp the significance of his discovery, or he'd grown disheartened by the difficulties involved in working with it. Eventually, he abandoned his attempts to purify penicillin, leaving the task for another research team to pursue approximately a decade later. In 1937, a team at Oxford University, led by Howard Florey and Ernst Chain, began experimenting with penicillin. Like Fleming before them, they initially struggled to purify the substance. However, after devoting three years exclusively to the task, the team finally succeeded in producing enough penicillin to begin testing. Their experiment started with trials on lab mice in 1940, and the results were so promising that within a year, they progressed to human trials and successfully cured life-threatening infections. Although the Oxford team didn't start their work until the onset of World War II, their efforts proved so effective that by 1943, penicillin was in widespread use among Allied troops, saving countless lives and reshaping the future of medicine, all thanks to a forgotten Petri dish tucked away in a cluttered lab. Thank you for watching.